Good morning. I, I read a statistic from the Barna Group that said this. 70% uh, of all young people who grew up in the church leave the church in their 20s. Allow that to sink in just for a second. Um, I don't know about you, but this hits hard uh, right here. Uh, this has been going on for years, way before I was even alive. But what children are learning in school and at home is that the Bible is outdated, uh, goes against science, uh, does not relate to us anymore. Uh, cancel culture is at an all-time high, as we are seeing uh, in in our world today, uh, ministries are being shut down, sports teams are being renamed, uh, organizations folding, you name it. Um, our entire country is in a spiritual decline, and I must admit, it's a it's a very difficult time to be a parent today, and a difficult time to be a pastor. Um, can you imagine seventy percent? of the children here at Marysville Community Church giving up on church. Now that's almost every child that comes on a Sunday, on a regular Sunday. We, we basically would be left with two kids. Um, not two is better than none, but we would be dropping in quite, quite an amount. And as a church, we need to wake up to what's happening in our world. And I'm convinced that a healthy church requires healthy families. Now, before we continue any further, bow with me as we open in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a sovereign God and, and uh, all things are in your hands. And Father, may your light shine upon uh, this family and give us strength to overcome uh, all the difficulties that uh, we are dealing with. May you compel us as a church to proclaim your truth and, and preach your message. Uh, may we be the hospital that this community needs. Father, we know it won't always be easy and it may not be convenient, but your words are life to us. Uh, may you use them to rebuke us, uh, to encourage us, to correct us, and, and, and let us follow you as, as we hold each other accountable. Father, only you can give us great patience and the, and the words to teach. May our church here be known as a house of prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, whether you have children at home or not, all of this applies to us. And today I want to answer the question, what can we do to lead our families to be healthy church members or church goers? And I read a story about a pastor who, was asked, who asked a, a group of children on a Sunday school class uh, this question. Why do you love God. Well, there was numerous answers, and the children eagerly offered a, a variety of them, and such as, because God first loved us, and because Jesus died for us. Great answers. But the one that really caught the pastor's attention was, I guess loving God just runs in our family. Wasn't that a great answer to the question. Now the question comes back at us. Does loving God and loving his church run in your family? Today we're talking about a family and about family and loving God. It's our job as healthy church members to lead our families to love the Lord and the church that the Lord Jesus Christ died for for and is the head of. A spiritual healthy 
families make for spiritually healthy churches. And I want us to hear this as clear as day. Um, Marysville Community Church will never be healthier spiritually than the families that make up this church family. And further, Marysville Community Church will never rise above the spiritual commitment of our families. Now, this is a challenge for all of us as we look to grow in our spiritual journeys individually and as a congregation reaching out to the community. And we need to know where we stand before we can grow. Now, Pastor Dexter James now, summed up the average North American church when he said this. People want to eat steak and potatoes when the preacher stands up to preach. But they find it hard to digest when they've feasted on cotton candy all through the week. He continued, there is little spiritual death, depth sorry, in many Christian families today. And so before we moan and complain about losing the right to carry our Bibles or pray in school or any, or in any public uh, environment or the right to meet in person uh, for Sunday worship, as, as has been the case for over a year for many churches, especially here in BC, uh, we better wake up and realize the reason that we've lost some of these uh, fundamental privileges in the public arenas because we've abandoned them first in our homes. As speaking on behalf of the leadership here of our church, we believe it's important that we, we focus on reaching and equipping families to establish found, foundational values, biblical truths, to pray together uh, for the church, to worship together, to serve together, and to fall deeper in love with the body of Christ that that Jesus gave us, gave his life for us. And with saying that, I realize that we as a congregation, really, for the better half of, uh, of a year, have had to take it on the chin, so to speak, with meeting together in person, uh, with trying to accomplish these goals on a, on a personal matter, face to face. And it takes a toll on many, and myself included. But I do know that the Lord is in control. Uh, presence statistics don't look good, honestly, for the long-term future of the church. And yet God has turned people's hearts before, and I believe he can do it again. Amen? Well, this morning we're going back to the Old Testament, uh, to Genesis chapter 35. Uh, but before we get to that text, let me explain the context of this passage, kind of getting to it. Uh, we could do a whole sermon series on, on the chapters before, and that's pretty grueling. But let's take a look here. God chose a man named Abraham to be the father of many nations. And he promised that through the line of Abraham will come a Savior, Jesus Christ. And so... Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob ended up having 12 sons who later represented it, the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, before you get to chapter 35, which is a little nicer chapter to uh, preach on and read through, you come to some very difficult chapters, some very difficult passages and we find that there are consequences of disobedience um, to God, from God, really, when we fail to follow his lead. Now, there are lessons to learn here for us. Uh, Jacob's spiritual apathy and uh, passive response in these chapters leading to chapter 35 leads to the abuse of his daughter, the unjust uh, destruction of the city of Shechem. Uh, sin leads to more sin. And yet God is faithful and just to work his plan, even in these dark 
uh, times, situations, and it's the same for us here today. And this is a clearly a traumatic event in Jacob's family. Uh, we've had, probably all of us have had those types of events in our families. And so how do you even begin going about in fixing this? How can we lead our families to be healthy church members? Well, I think first off, we need to step back for a moment, recognize the fact that we do not live in a perfect world. Uh, We're not perfect by all means. And so our fellowship with the body of Christ is made up of all kinds of families, all kinds of individuals and sinners. And each one, regardless of our type of family, uh, we are to do what we can to instill the right family values based on God's word, in our families, in our churches, in our communities, and in our world. So let's begin by reading Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. Now here God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Well, anyone who uh, follows sports in general knows that the occasional slumps are part of the game. Uh, That being losing slumps, a long period of time. Well, that can even get into the Christian life, if we're not careful. Uh, With a short overview of chapter 35, you may have noticed that Jacob was in a spiritual slump. You can go back and read through that later if you like. But if you've walked with the Lord for any time at all, you've gone through spiritual slumps where the Lord seems distant. You maybe have hit a plateau where you seem to get stuck. And usually you're not aware of it right away, but at some point you realize that you're not as excited about the Lord as he used to be. Now you're still going to church or an online version, reading your Bible, praying, but you've lost your first love. Well, Jacob was there too. The the trick isn't getting into a spiritual slump. Um, I believe most of us have done that without much trouble. The trick is getting out. How do we start growing again. Well, we get out by responding obediently to God's word. And sometimes we must go back to the place we encountered God and obey God's calling. But sometimes our faith becomes weak and we get distracted. Sometimes we forget really how powerful and how good God is. And we forget the power of prayer. And we start to focus on how much our own on our own issues our own problems and our minds lead us astray from God and we see here that God was calling Jacob to get up and to go worship him and God here is telling Jacob to go back to the place where he spoke to him and changed his life go and worship me God says the place where Jacob was running for his life from his brother Esau And this is encouraging for us. God wants us to come back to him and grow even after a decade of of spiritual slump, say. Even after disaster like Genesis chapter 34. Even after we see the, the parable of the prodigal son, the father. He's always welcomes them back in with open arms. His grace should motivate us to respond obediently to him. I might be stretching here, a little juggling, but I believe it goes together. With pointing to a good example. Let's let's begin with the importance of the marital relationship in the spiritual life of the family. If you turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 28, we have here really how the Holy Spirit inspired Paul. How the Spirit inspired Paul to teach how the human family unit is, in, is a parallel to 
the spiritual family union. Now, Paul taught that just as Jesus Christ is the head of the church, in the same way the husband is to be the head of the family. And this implies sacrificial leadership as Christ willingly sacrificed his life for the church. So the husband must be willing to sacrifice his life for his wife and family. And it applies that the wife should demonstrate a submissive response to her husband. And the husband should also demonstrate a submissive submission to Christ and to the church as the church is to submit to the leadership of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, the children are to be obedient to their parents because in his infinite wisdom saw the value in creating social order and obedience to parents really is one aspect of that social order. And here's the truth. God will continue to call you back to himself. He will continue to call you by name and say, Hey, Joe, get up and go worship me. So how do we lead our family to be healthy church members? Well, I believe obeying God's calling comes into play here. God intended to build all of society on the foundation of marriage and family. He did that for a reason, and that is revealed in the advent of Jesus Christ. Marriage is a living picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. And when that part breaks down, it, it mars the whole of man's existence. And we're seeing this at an alarming rate in society right now. When we look at Ephesians chapter 22 to 28, for example, this relationship between Christ and the church is based on the premise that Christ loved the church unconditionally and gave his life for her. Now, the bride, that being the church, loves Christ back and as an expression of this love willingly submits to him because of the unconditional love that he has shown to her. And we must admit and identify and put anything away that hinders our drawing near to God. We must cleanse ourselves by confessing sin. And we must change our outward behavior. Other way to get out of a spiritual slump is in response to God's grace. In response to God's grace is to obey what God is telling you to do right now well, let's continue to verse 2 so Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments when we look back in chapter 34 Jacob's two sons killed all the men in the city of Shechem uh, they took a bunch of their stuff. Uh, this included their idols of worship, jewelry uh, that were used to worship their false gods. Now, Jacob's starting to smarten up here a little bit. He's calling them to get rid of it, to shower, uh, to put on their best clothes. He's, he's maturing in his walk. He, he's recognized his commitments to the Lord from earlier on in his life and now he's kind of growing up in his spirituality he's, he's now instructing his family to live by them he didn't do a very good job in the past chapters we, we you can see that if you read in more detail but now he's starting to look to god and we need to recall that in spite of our sin, our spiritual dullness, the Lord is faithful. And that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And Jacob here is telling his family to clean up, uh, to change, to start a journey to Bethel, to worship God. And if you think about it, uh, this journey would most obviously ruin their clothes. 
Now, we need to set our minds in the surroundings and the time period that this took place. Uh, they're not driving cars. Uh, they're walking in the dirt for three days at least, many miles covered, in footwear that we here would throw out, have no have nothing to do with it. Uh, this is a long journey. Why put on your best clothes if it's only going to be ruined? Well, this doesn't make any sense. But do you know what it is? It is the symbolic meaning of preparing our hearts to worship God. And the very act of showering and putting on clean clothes to worship God is in, in itself worship to God. The question we need to ask ourselves here is, are we preparing our hearts to encounter God every day? Are we preparing our hearts to encounter God on Sundays? Yes, even when we're home alone, all by ourselves, the question again is, is our hearts prepared to worship in, in song? Uh, to meditate on the scripture. Allow the message to change us. And we know that our church is not the kind of church where you must dress to impress. Uh, you don't have to wear a tie. I do once in a while. I haven't on these videos, that's for sure. We simply want you to wear clothes. <laughs> but, but there's a difference between one who comes in with their heart ready and one who comes in with a heart that's not ready. Jacob here, he's asking his family to change their ways. The way we act, the way we talk, the way we behave, the things that we post on social media, it has an effect on the people around us, our family, our children, our friends, you name it. Here's a thought from a friend of mine, uh, Ron Salih. Says this, I may have political thoughts and there is the possibility that some might even be correct. But the only concern, but they only concern temporal matters, not eternal truth. If we're blasting them into the public square by Facebook, Twitter, etc., it would convince no one and only serve to polarize, separate, alienate, and ultimately antagonize the other side. To what end? To get applause from like-minded partisans? It would only ensure that Anything I had to say about eternal truth would be discounted and rejected by those on the other side of these temporal issues. Christians need to examine themselves on this, for they will give an account to their stewardship of the gospel. And so as a church and individuals, we need to be careful what we say and do. And most of all, we need to put to death sin in our lives for the sake of our family. It will strengthen our family, strengthen our church. Let's turn away from the way the world deals with issues. We deal with issues by getting rid of our sin. Let's purify ourselves. Let's prepare our hearts to worship God. How do we lead our family to be healthy? We lead our families by example. Verse 3 says, Then let us arise and go to Bethel, so that we, that I might make an, there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. The best way to teach your children about obedience is by living in obedience to the Lord ourselves. Then, if you reinforce that with biblical teaching, they have a reference point to draw from. Jacob was an example to his family. And like us, he wasn't perfect, yet God used him. 
And not only should the world see a godly example in our homes, our, in our marriages, but, and this is so vital, our children, our grandchildren desperately need to see a godly example in our marriages, in our obedience individually to God as a pattern for our children's lives and for the sake of the gospel message. And our godly message, marriages, sorry, or if we're single, our lives point our children to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our obedient example models what a relationship with God should look like. How do we lead our family to be healthy? Well, we help them grow spiritually. Verse 4 says, So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, and the rings that, they were, that were on their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. Now, Jacob's family gave up their false gods. Who buried them? Jacob did. The leader of the family did that. What is it that is going to help our children grow spiritually? Short answer, prayer and the word of God. Obedience to God's word. We may be required to give up what we're doing right now to put our family first and help them grow spiritually. Verses 5 to 7 says, And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is the land of Canaan. And he and all the people who were, who were with him, and there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him. And when he fled, from his brother. How do we lead our family to be healthy? We worship God together. We see here that Jacob's sons messed with the wrong people, trying to make a wrong right. They were scared. I'm sure the whole family was scared. Yet Jacob gathered his family and worshiped God together. And when the going gets tough, or better yet, when it's good, we need to meet with God's people and worship God. As Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Families are a wonderful blessing, but there's also responsibility and privilege. You have chores that you need to do, involvement that is, that is expected from you. Allow your brothers and sisters to hold you accountable. We need that. And Jesus says, if you love me, love the people that I love. Do we understand the difference between being a guest or a family member in a home? Well, here's a couple of differences. A guest gets waited on, served. But there are privileges of a family member that a guest will never enjoy. We're not to be merely guests in our spiritual home. We are family. But family also has responsibility. When you as a guest get invited over for supper, you don't have to do a thing. When the meal is done, if you try to take your plate to the kitchen, you are seen as being helpful. But if you're a family member, you're expected to take the plates and get started on washing the dishes and clearing the table. Well, many Christians today need to take the transition from being a guest in the spiritual house to be a full member of the family. You have chores in God's family. There are things to be done. We're to be doers. But the payoff is wonderful. So here are some questions from our passage this morning. 
Are you putting your sin to death? Are you leading by example? Are you helping your family grow spiritually if you still have family at home? And even if they're not at home? Are you leading by example? Are you growing spiritually? Ask yourself this morning, how is my current relationship with Jesus going? I don't let this be a checklist mentality of meeting all the requirements. Within our homes, do we find it easier to criticize others that are part of our church family than to love them? Do you talk about spiritual matters in your families outside of church? Does your family see how much you love the Word of God? Do your children see how much you love Christ's church? Do you set the example by helping with the chores in your spiritual family, by serving in the church? Do you pray for your church and the things that pertain to the family of God with your family? When we look at this passage here this morning that we're have gone through and reflection coming out of a, a spiritual slump per se doesn't guarantee that life will be rosy obedience doesn't mean a trouble-free life but in the trials God uses to shake us out of a spiritual indifference and to keep us trusting him uh, we have the God of Jacob as our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And I find it significant, as I was going through this, studying for this little passage here in chapter 35, looking at the context before it. And we see here that before chapter 35, Chapter 34 is just covered in sin. And what I noticed was that God is not even mentioned at all in chapter 34. But in chapter 35, God's name appears 11 times, plus 12 more times in the names of Israel, Bethel, El Bethel, El Shaddai. The trials can either, can either make us self-focused focused or God-focused. And if we allow these trials to help us put God back in the rightful center of our lives, we will recover from a spiritual slump as Jacob did. Let's start to change at home. Imagine being able to impact our families and then, and then God strengthening our family. And that overflowing, and then taking that and it overflowing into our church here at Marysville. Can you imagine the impact that we can make in our community? Nothing will be able to stop what God will do in and through us a broken people which is all of us but especially those outside of our walls will find hope when they meet us because we have stories just like Jacob I will be able to tell them the times that God encountered us when we were lost stories of the struggles our children went through and how as a family we put God first in everything stories of our children leading others to Christ. Stories of making a difference at work or in our neighborhoods. As we close here this morning, this is the fifth pledge from the book, I Am a Church Member. And it says this, I will lead my family 
to be good members of this church. We will pray together for our church. We will worship together in our church. We will serve together in our church. And we will ask Christ to help us fall deeper in love with this church because he gave his life for her. Bow with me as we close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the example of Jacob this morning. Father, your word tells us that there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people. And we must be saved by it. Father, may you direct our hearts to understand the fullness of your character, your heart, your truth. Father, may you fill us with your spirit to boldly proclaim that there is salvation in no one else but you. Father, through your church, may we shout your name. May we lift up your name for all to hear and all to see. Teach us how to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, you are holy. You are righteous. And you are worthy of our praise. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.